In the land of Yuzi, in a time long forgotten, there lived a man named Job. Renowned for his wealth and piety, Job was the most prosperous man in all the East. With vast herds of livestock, a loving wife, and ten adoring children, Job seemed to have it all. Most importantly, he was blameless and upright, always careful to avoid evil and honor God. Each morning, Job would rise early to offer burnt offerings for each of his children, thinking, perhaps they have sinned and renounced God in their hearts. This was Job's regular practice, for he greatly feared the Lord. One day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord asked Satan, Where have you come from? From roaming throughout the earth? Satan replied, Have you considered my servant Job? The Lord said, There is no one like him on the earth, blameless, upright, fearing God and shunning evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan scoffed. Haven't you put a hedge of protection around him and all he owns? You've blessed everything he does. But stretch out your hand and strike all he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And Satan departed from the Lord's presence. One day, as Job's children were feasting in their oldest brother's house, a messenger arrived with devastating news. The Sabaeans had attacked, stealing all the oxen and donkeys and killing the servants. Before he had finished speaking, another messenger arrived. The fire of God fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and servants. Yet another came with more tragic tidings. The Chaldeans raided the camels and put the servants to the sword. Finally, the most heartbreaking news of all. Your sons and daughters were feasting when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and collapsed the house. They are all dead. At this, Job stood up, tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell to the ground in worship. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrongdoing. Again the angels came before the Lord, and Satan returned as well. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? He still maintains his integrity, even though you incited me against him to ruin him without reason. Skin for skin, Satan replied, A man will give all he has for his own life but stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. Very well then, the Lord said. He is in your hands, but you must spare his life. So Satan afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. As Job scraped himself with a piece of broken pottery, his wife said, Are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. But Job replied, you speak as a foolish woman. Shall we accept only good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. When Job's three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, heard about his suffering, they set out to console and comfort him. Seeing his anguish, they sat with him in silence for seven days and nights, for his pain was very great. After this, Job opened his mouth and began to lament his plight and question why God would allow such calamity to befall him. His friends then tried to explain Job's misery, suggesting he must have sinned to deserve such punishment from God. But Job maintained his innocence and continued to trust God despite his affliction. Though he slay me, yet will I hope in him, Job declared. He longed to argue his case before the Almighty, confident that he would be vindicated. After many rounds of debate and accusation, the Lord himself spoke to Job out of the storm. Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. The Lord then recounted the wonders of creation and the mysteries of the universe, humbling Job with a series of unanswerable questions. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades or loose Orion's belt? Do you give the horse its strength or clothe its neck with a flowing mane? Job replied, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. Satisfied that Job now recognized his own insignificance compared to God's infinite wisdom, 
the Lord then rebuked Job's friends for presuming to speak falsely about him. He instructed them to offer sacrifices and have Job pray for them, lest he deal with them according to their folly. After Job prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and blessed the latter part of his life more than the former. He gave Job twice as much as he had before 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen and 1,000 donkeys. Job also had seven more sons and three more daughters, and he lived to see four generations of his descendants. So Job died, an old man full of years, having seen with his own eyes the Lord's compassion and mercy. Not far from where Job's story unfolded, in the city of Uar in the land of the Chaldeans, another faithful man sought to walk blamelessly before God. Abram, though advanced in years and childless, clung to God's promise that he would become the father of many nations, his descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. One day, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram lamented, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless, with no heir but a servant in my household? Then the Lord took Abram outside and said, Look up at the heavens and count the stars. If indeed you can count them, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Some time later, when Abram was ninety-nine years old, the Lord appeared to him and reaffirmed his covenant. I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants. And I will be their God. God also said to Abram, As for Sarai your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Abram fell face down in awe, but wondered in his heart. Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of ninety? Then God said, Your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. Now the Lord had determined to judge the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah for their grave sins. But first, he visited Abraham, as God now called him, in the form of three men. As was his custom, Abraham humbly and generously welcomed the visitors, washing their feet and preparing a fine feast for them. As they ate, the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah your wife will have a son. Sarah, who was listening at the entrance of the tent, laughed to herself in disbelief. But the Lord asked Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child, now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah, afraid, denied laughing. But the Lord replied, Yes, you did laugh. Then the men rose to leave, and Abraham walked with them to see them on their way. The Lord pondered, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him, so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. So the Lord revealed his plans to Abraham. The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if their actions fully justify the cry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The other two men went toward Sodom, but the Lord remained with Abraham. Then Abraham boldly approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are fifty righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the fifty? Far be it for you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating them alike. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? The Lord replied, if I find fifty righteous people in Sodom, I will spare the whole city for their sake. Emboldened, Abraham pressed further. What if there are five less than fifty? 
The Lord agreed not to destroy it if forty-five were found there. Again Abraham spoke. What if only forty are found? The Lord assured he would not do it for the sake of forty. Abraham, trembling, ventured again. May the Lord not be angry, but let me speak. What if only thirty, twenty, ten can be found there? For the sake of only ten righteous, the Lord promised to spare the city. When he had finished speaking, the Lord departed and Abraham returned home. Now Abraham's nephew Lot, a righteous man tormented by the depraved conduct of the lawless in Sodom, welcomed the two visiting angels into his home, insisting they not spend the night in the square. But before they retired for the night, the wicked men of the city surrounded Lot's house, demanding he hand over his guests so they could have their way with them. Lot, seeking to appease them, foolishly offered up his virgin daughters instead, an act that only inflamed the mob's desire to do evil. They rushed the door, but the angels struck the men with blindness and then warned Lot. Do you have anyone else here sons, daughters, sons-in-law? Get them out of here because we are going to destroy this place. The outcry to the Lord against its people is so great that he has sent us to destroy it. Lot pleaded with his sons-in-law, but they thought he was joking. At dawn, the angels urged a hesitating Lot. Hurry, take your wife and daughters and go or you will be swept away when the city is punished. Still Lot lingered, so the angels grasped his hand and rushed Lot and his family out, the Lord being merciful. Flee for your lives, they warned. Don't look back, and don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains or you will die. But Lot negotiated with them, saying, I can't flee to the mountains. The disaster will overtake me and I'll die. This town over here is close enough to run to, and it's small. Please let me flee to it so my life will be spared. The Lord conceded, Very well, I will grant this request too. I will not overthrow the town you speak of, but flee there quickly, because I cannot do anything until you reach it. By the time Lot reached Zor, the sun had risen over the land. Then the Lord rained down sulfur and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah, a catastrophic judgment from the Lord out of the heavens. He overthrew those cities and the entire plain, destroying all those living in the cities and the vegetation in the land. But Lot's wife, trailing behind, looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. The next morning, Abraham saw dense smoke rising from the land, like smoke from a furnace, and knew the Lord had acted. Yet even as he mourned the destruction, Abraham trusted that the judge of all the earth had done right. Some time later, the Lord did as he had promised Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age. Abraham named his son Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day, just as God commanded. Abraham was a hundred years old when Isaac was born to him. Sarah rejoiced, God has brought me laughter, all who here will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. As the child grew and was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But when Sarah caught Ishmael, Hagar's teenage son, mocking Isaac, she demanded that Abraham send away the slave woman and her son, refusing to have Ishmael share in Isaac's inheritance. The matter distressed Abraham, but God reassured him, Listen to Sarah for it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. As for Ishmael, I will make him into a nation also, because he is your offspring. So early the next morning, Abraham sent Hagar and Ishmael away into the desert of Beersheba with some food and water. When the water was gone, Hagar put the boy under a bush and sat down nearby, about a bowshot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. As she sat there weeping, God heard Ishmael crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar, Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy. Lift him up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. So she filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up in the desert and became an archer, living in the desert of Paran. Meanwhile, Abraham sojourned in the land of the Philistines, where God tested him once more. Take your son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah, the Lord instructed. 
sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham saddled his donkey, took two servants and Isaac, and set out for the place God had designated. Spotting the mountain on the third day, Abraham had his servants wait while he and Isaac proceeded alone, carrying fire and wood, a knife and the sacrifice itself. As they climbed, a puzzled Isaac noted, We have fire and wood, but where is the lamb for the sacrifice? God himself will provide the lamb, Abraham replied, his heart heavy yet resolute. Upon reaching the appointed place, he built an altar, arranged the wood, bound his beloved son, and laid him on top. As Abraham grasped the knife to slay his son, the angel of the Lord called out from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld your only son from me. Looking up, Abraham saw a ram caught by its horns in a nearby thicket. He took the ram and sacrificed it instead of his son. Abraham named that place, the Lord will provide. A second time the angel of the Lord called to Abraham, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and not withheld your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed, because you have obeyed me. So Abraham returned to his servants, and together they set off for Beersheba, where Abraham stayed for a long time. There he reflected on all that had transpired God's faithfulness in providing a son, his mercy in sparing that son on the mountain, his sovereignty in orchestrating every event to fulfill his perfect plan. He marveled at the profound truth he had glimpsed on Moriah. Somehow, someday, God himself would provide the ultimate sacrifice for the sins of all humanity. A spotless lamb would be offered up in place of Abraham's descendants, Isaac's descendants, the people of Israel. And through that act, all the families of the earth would find blessing. In faith, Abraham looked forward to the city with eternal foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And in due time, the long-awaited son was born, not just a son for Abraham and Sarah, but the divine Son who would reconcile Jew and Gentile, saint and sinner, through his atoning death and victorious resurrection. Jesus Christ, the promised seed of Abraham, proved to be the true and final sacrifice provided by God himself, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, whose precious blood purchased a people from every tribe and language and nation, heirs together of the glorious inheritance secured by the Father of faith. And so, across the ages and pages of Scripture, the redemptive plan of God unfolds in the lives of flawed yet faithful sojourners. From the blood-soaked ground of Eden to the banks of the Jordan, from the heights of Moriah to the hill of Calvary, the scarlet thread of salvation history weaves its way toward a cosmic consummation paradise lost becoming paradise restored. Job's anguished lament gives voice to humanity's plaintive cry, echoing down through dust and time. If a man dies, will he live again, millennia later? The answer resounds in an empty Judean tomb, as the risen Christ shatters the shackles of sin and death once for all. Abraham's obedient sojourn foreshadows the ultimate pilgrimage of the Son, who did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, and humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Lot's tale of compromise and consequences whispers a timeless warning, the world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. For only by fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, can we escape the snares of this passing age. Isaac's miraculous birth and brush with sacrificial death paint a poignant picture of the one who would be uniquely conceived by the Spirit, then pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities, his wounds securing our peace, his stripes procuring our healing. Ishmael and Isaac, locked in a timeless tug of war, portend the perennial tension between those enslaved to the flesh and those born of the Spirit. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. Yet for all who are led by the Spirit of God, an eternal inheritance awaits, not as slaves, but as sons and daughters of the living God. Indeed, in every epoch and extremity, these ancient narratives pulsate with living truth for today.
They beckon us to ponder the purposes of God in our own pain and pleasure, to perceive His providential hand in the mundane and momentous. They bid us look beyond fleeting hardship to a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, to trust the slow and often inscrutable unfolding of the Father's good and perfect will. Weaving triumph out of tragedy, new beginnings out of bitter endings, God is forever at work in the shadows and the spotlight, orchestrating all things for the good of those who love Him. Whether in plenty or in want, in rejoicing or in mourning, His adopted children can echo the hard-won refrain of the patriarch. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? And with each testing of trust, each relinquishing of cherished hopes and dreams, the bonds of faith are forged ever stronger. As we trace the footsteps of these ancient sojourners, may we too learn to walk by faith and not by sight, to store up treasure in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy. Spurning the fleeting baubles of this realm, may we set our hearts on pilgrimage to a better country, to the city with foundations whose builder and architect is God himself. Though outwardly wasting away, inwardly renewed day by day, may we hold fast to the truth that our light and momentary afflictions are producing for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. For the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory soon to be revealed in us and to us, a glory glimpsed from afar by the likes of Job and Abraham, now streaming into focus through the brilliant prism of Christ. So let us fix our eyes not on the seen, but the unseen, setting our minds not on earthly things, but on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Lifting high the battle-scarred banner of the kingdom, let us press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of us, straining toward what is ahead, heaven-bent and glory-bound. Looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, let us throw off every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles us, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out before us. For at the end of our sojourn, beyond that final bend in the road, a great cloud of witnesses awaits our arrival, the welcomed heirs in a kingdom prepared since the foundation of the world, come at last to a shining city of indestructible life. So take heart, fellow pilgrim. Soon, very soon, we shall see our true home on the far horizon. And there we shall behold the face of the one who loved us and gave himself for us, the Lamb upon the throne, whose glory is the lamp of the holy city. And God will wipe away every tear from our eyes, and death shall be no more, nor mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for these former things will have passed away. The Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, will thunder over that sacred assembly. Behold, I am making all things new, and the bride, radiant, arrayed in fine linen, will rejoice forevermore with her beloved. Surely this is our God. We trusted in Him, and He saved us. Let us rejoice and be glad in His salvation, so come quickly, Lord Jesus. Maranatha, may the grace of the Lord Jesus be with all the saints. Amen.